Hey folks, Quillateen here, and welcome to another episode of our Guide to Kerbal Space Program for Complete Beginners. We're actually nearing very close to the end of a lot of the super basic stuff. Um, and, you know, we're getting close to the point where we're going to be able to hand you over to a more regular Let's Play. But we still have a couple of really important things to do in that we still haven't actually gone to space. And this is Kerbal Space Program, so let's get that done. Currently, I have two contracts over here, two, one to escape the atmosphere and one to orbit Kerbin. And these are different things, of course. It's one thing to escape the atmosphere and technically be in space. It's an entirely different thing to stay in space. It is very easy to get to space. That is even true in real life. Getting to space is not very hard. Staying in space is incredibly tricky because staying in space involves going sideways very fast. It's not about going up, it's about going sideways. More on that a little bit later. So let's go back to our vehicle assembly building here, and we're going to design a new spacecraft. This spacecraft is almost certainly simply going to reach space, but not stay, not necessarily stay in space, and that's okay. Once again, go ahead and start with a new blank slate if you want. We're going to go and drop a Mark 1 command pod in here. Now, this Mark 1 command pod is going to have to return to Earth from space. That means it really is going to need two things. Yes, certainly, it is still going to require a parachute. Notice that we did, again, unlock last episode, uh, two of the radial chutes over here. So the radial chutes go on the side, but we're not going to use that. We're going to be quite happy to simply use the Mark 16 parachute, same as before. But coming back from space involves, I mean, we're going to be going fast, and we're going to be coming back and hitting the air very, 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 very fast. And as such, things are gonna get very, very, very hot. It's not actually friction of the air that heats things up, it's compression, but the end result is the same. When we come back from space, we're gonna be on fire. So what we're gonna want is some thermal protection here, mostly in terms of a heat shield. Currently we have two different sized heat shields. This one here is too small. This is the 0.625 meter heat shield. It's, it's much too tiny. It doesn't protect the entire bottom of our um, command pod. We want the 1.25 meter one. All of the, the, the parts that we're working on right now tend to be in the one and a quarter meter um, radius size right now, so that's the standard. So you can see this heat shield fits very perfectly at the bottom of our capsule. This is what we're coming back with, ah, plus probably some science experiments, but that we'll leave that there for a second. Um, this is what we're coming back with, okay? If we have anything else, let's say we still had an engine when we were coming back from space. This engine here would get very hot, burn up, and explode, possibly taking the rest of our pod with us. It is going to be very important when we return that the heat shield is the thing that's pointing into the air. All of the air that is hitting our ship and is very hot, we want it to hit the heat shield. We want to come down butt first. Okay? Very important. If you come down pointy side first, horrible things will happen. You want the butt to come down first because it's got the heat shield. It also happens to be aerodynamically stable that if we come down this way, the air will actually naturally keep our, our fat butt into the wind, which is exactly what we're looking for. So we don't want an engine down here. So how do we ensure that we come back with just this? Well, that's where decouplers come into play. Okay, the coupling category over here will have a variety of decouplers. Some include stack decouplers and others will include radial ones that are on the side. Right now we have a single one, the TR-18A stack decoupler. If we click on this thing and we attach it underneath this, what this decoupler will do, notice the arrow, is when we trigger this, which can happen via staging or if we want we can right click on it, what it will do is it will decouple from this side. It will detach over here. It actually has a slight explosive force um, to push the parts across. So what we're going to end up with after we trigger this decoupler, we will end up with just this over here, which is kind of interesting. And anything else attached to the other side of the decoupler will just whoosh, go away. It'll, it'll be gone. So that means we will end up with exactly the return pod that we are looking for. So what's going to go underneath this decoupler? Well, we need to go up, so it sounds like we need an engine. Now, up until now, we have worked with the FLEA solid fuel booster, okay? And this got us to what? 10,000 kilometers or something like that? Or 10,000 meters, I should say. In a sense, we could go higher if what we did is we just say, took another decoupler and then put another engine, right? We could do this. We could light this engine first, then when it's out of juice, we can decouple light this engine, and then once it's out of juice, we can decouple again, 
and come back down with whatever's left over. And you know what? If we kept doing that, we might, we probably could actually reach space. But solid rocket boosters, again, we don't get a whole lot of control with the solid fuel. We don't get the throttle up and down, and it doesn't really have much in the way of steering control. That hasn't been a problem so far when we just want to go up a little and come down a bit. But the thing is, when you go to space, if you go straight up, you're going to come straight down again, and that will actually involve coming down really, really fast. We need to slow down because of the air. The air resistance is going to slow us down as we come back down from space. So if you come straight down, there's only going to be so much air in the way before you hit the ground. So that's very, very, very dangerous. It's much safer to come down sideways, because if we come down sideways, we're going to be going through a lot more air before we finally hit the ground somewhere over here. That means we're going to get slowed down a lot more, and that's a lot better and a lot safer. The only way to come down sideways is if we go up sideways, because again, at some point we run out of juice. Um, we're going to be taking a sort of ballistic curve out of here. What do I mean? Well, actually, look at the circle. What we want to do is we want to take off kind of like this. We'll run out of gas somewhere around here. We'll keep coasting like this, and at some point we'll start coming down. And again, we're coming down at an angle, and that means we're going to cut through more air before we hit the ground. That's a good thing. But we need to be able to steer for that. And again, we have very little ability to steer with, ju with just these engines. The ability to rotate our command mod pod isn't quite enough. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take all these engines off and just trash them. Go away. So again, I'm going to keep the decoupler, and we've got the heat shield. But instead of solid rockets, even, and we do have a bigger solid rocket as well, we're going to use our liquid fuel engine for the first time. Liquid fuel engine is excellent. It actually tends to be a little bit more efficient. Solid fuel boosters are insanely cheap and give you a lot of oomph, but not for very long. Whereas fueled engines tend to burn for a lot longer and therefore move you a lot further. This swivel engine over here also has the ability to gimbal. This means that the engine itself will tip and tilt and let us steer via the engine, giving us a substantial more control over our ship, which sounds like a pretty good thing. So, we want this engine. The problem is, if I do this, ain't nothing gonna happen, because this needs fuel. The solid rocket boosters come with their own fuel built in. The engine does not. It's literally just the engine. So we need to go to the category above it, which is our fuel tanks. Now, we only have one fuel tank right now, the FLT-100, which contains 100 liters, effectively, of fuel. It's actually a mix of liquid fuel and oxidizer. The reason is, for things to burn, there needs to be oxygen around which is not a problem if you're on a planet where there's oxygen in the air. Things will be able to burn. However, when you're in space, this fuel, you can't light a fire because there's no oxygen. So you have to bring your own oxidizer. And really, this liquid fuel in this setup is designed to only burn as a combination of liquid fuel and oxidizer. And these fuel tanks are always designed to have the correct ratio of the liquid fuel and oxidizer. They'll burn through at exactly the same rate, so that's okay. So we can put a fuel tank down there, and then we could put an engine underneath it. But this won't go very far, because that's not really a lot of fuel. But what we can do is we can put, sorry, a little bit of a misclick there out of the game, we can put more fuel tanks on here. How many fuel tanks can we put on? Each one of these has a weight. They all weigh a little more than half a ton. So how much can we put on here before the ship won't go anywhere? Well, a great way to answer that is unfortunately to use a tiny little bit of math. I know, it's terrible. But that's the way it is. What you have to remember is when we're when we're you know when we're at a planet, the planet has gravity. Gravity is pulling down on your ship. It's pulling down on your ship with a certain amount of force. How much is gravity pulling down on your ship? Well, that's your weight. That's a direct factor of your ship's weight. How heavy is the ship right now? We can find out by going down to the bottom right corner over here and looking at the engineer's report. I'm just gonna click on it to keep it open here. So we can find out some information about our craft. We currently have nine parts on our craft out of a maximum of 30. Your vehicle assembly building is what determines the maximum number of parts you can use. At level one, we have a limit of 30. If we level up to level two, I think the limit becomes like 255 or something. It goes up fast. We also have a current mass. Our ship currently weighs five tons. There is a limit of 18 tons. This limit is determined by your launch pad. If you need more weight, you upgrade your launch pad. So we're, we're well below our maximums, that's fine. But the important thing to note right now is that our ship weighs five tons, okay? Gravity, just like on Earth, 
So on Kerbin, the gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? 9.8 is awfully close to 10. As it so happens, if you take your weight, five tons, and multiply it by the gravity, which we're just gonna call 10 for simplicity, so five times 10 equals 50. 50 is the amount of force that gravity is applying to this spaceship right now, pulling it downwards. So if we want the spaceship to go up, we need to be able to, we need to push up by over 50 power going upwards. And that's where your engine's rating comes in. Right over here, you see your engine and its thrust in kilonewtons? Kilonewtons is the same as that five tons times 10 for the strength of gravity is 50. Gravity is pulling down on this with a force of 50 kilonewtons. Our engine has a thrust at sea level, that's ASL over here, of 167. So that is more than three times the current force of gravity. So our engine's three times stronger than gravity, which means we're definitely going to go up. That's great. As it turns out, um, we actually have lots of extra thrust left over here. We could actually have our ship be quite a bit heavier. So let's go ahead and do something about that. We're gonna, I'm gonna click on this engine and move it aside for now. Then what I'm gonna do, so if you grab a part that's higher up the stack, it will grab all of it, right? Just like this. So we can grab all these from the root. If I hold shift and then click, Sorry, not shift. If I hold alt and then click, I'll actually make a copy from whatever I click on. So I can take this and plop it down to the bottom. And then let's put the engine down there. So now we're weighing um, 7 point, let's call that 7.3 for our mass. 7.3 times 10 is 73. 73 is still a lot lower than our thrust. So even though our ship's quite a bit heavier now, our engine still means we're gonna go up. And that's what you need to do. You want your thrust to be bigger than the force of gravity. Your engines are always rated in two fields. ASL is at sea level and vacuum or vac is in a vacuum. So this is how good it's gonna be in space and this is how good it's gonna be on the ground. Most engines are more efficient in space. Some engines are terrible at sea level, but they're really, really efficient in space. Um, the ISP over here is actually your fuel efficiency. So thrust is how much go it's got and ISP is how much fuel it has to burn to get that go. So later on, when we have multiple liquid fuel engines, we're gonna be able to compare things. But what we know for sure here is that we have enough thrust that we're gonna go up. If our ship was too heavy, we wouldn't go anywhere, but as it turns out, it will. So we know this is at least gonna do something. So let's go with that. Now, we do have the ability to steer the ship a little bit because of the reaction wheels up here, and more importantly, the gimbling of the engine. But if we want a little bit more stability, it's probably a good idea to go into aerodynamics and throw some fins on here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into symmetry, I'm gonna go with four-way symmetry, and I'm gonna put some fins down here. Now what are the fins going to do? When we are going up, remember that we can move in one direction that is different than the direction we are pointing in, right? It's entirely possible we start, we go up, and then what we do is we start making a right turn. So our ship is pointing off to the right, but for now we're still moving upwards, right? Just because we're pointing in a different direction doesn't mean we're not moving still in the same way. If our engine is burning, then, then when we're turning sideways, so if we're sideways and our engine is still on, our engine's gonna start pushing us further and further to the side. So we will start by moving straight up and then we're moving slightly to an angle, slightly more to an angle, slightly more to an angle, and finally we'll be moving in the same direction that we're pointing. Meanwhile, air is gonna be pushing on our ship. Let's switch temporarily over to Photoshop. I know, we're gonna get illustration, it's gonna be very exciting. Imagine the situation where, where's my paintbrush over here? Uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, imagine the situation where we are moving up. So we're moving this way, but what you can think about it is what we're doing is we're hitting air, right? Air is just static over here. So when we're hitting it, the way we can feel it, just like when you're sticking your hand out of a moving car, it actually feels like we're in this situation where we have a spaceship over here, right? And air is actually moving into us, right? This is how it's going to feel. So if our spaceship goes sideways while we're still moving up, what's gonna happen? Well, the air is gonna be pushing on us like this. And this means it's very easy when our ship is like this for it to start spinning uncontrollably. If ever your ship, and this will definitely happen to you at some point, you will be lifting off and then your ship will suddenly go sideways and then start flipping like mad and then probably rip itself apart and explode. It's because of this effect right over here. Now, if we're 
far enough from the ground, if we're at a high enough altitude, the air is going to be so thin that this isn't going to matter. And in fact, when we're in space, then it literally has no impact whatsoever because there's no more air up there. But this is a big problem while taking off. What fins do, however, right, if we have little stability fins over here, this actually kind of gives air another surface to hit first. It's going to hit this fin first and more significantly. And this fin, when the air hits here, this fin is going to want to go that way which means the top of our ship is going to want to go this way. The fin stops you from flipping out if you go a little sideways. The fins always want to move you back to something like this, okay? It wants you to turn back this way where you're facing directly into the air. That's the job of these fins. If you have huge giant fins on your, in your spacecraft, it's actually going to be really hard for you to steer because the fins are really going to want you to always face into the wind. So, they help, but don't overdo it. So, by having the fins on here, we're way less likely to flip out and die. And that sounds like a good thing. But these are tiny little basic fins, so the, the steering that we get from our engine and from our command pod over here should mean that we'll have enough control to be able to determine where we're going to turn, but we shouldn't die too quickly. So we're going to go ahead with this ship design, um, except we're going to add some science to it. Science! because we want to get some more science points and we're going to want to make sure to put it on the top part of our ship because we would like to come home with this science as well. Now, we don't want more than one science experiment because we've already gotten, well, we don't have everything. We don't actually have the, the, the barometer or the temperature from the atmosphere, but we really want to do the space parts of it. So let's go ahead and just come with one copy of it. Now the barometer and the mystery goo both have a little bit of weight. The thermometer is pretty light. Actually, the barometer is pretty light as well. Now, last time we did go for symmetry. You know what? I guess we still will. We're going to do symmetry. We have to make sure that it's all on the top of our ship, though, because this is the part that's coming home. So we need to bring these experiments home. So they have to be up here. Uh, they have to be maybe a little bit more centered over here. That's going to be swell. Let's throw a couple of press mat barometers over here. So this keeps the symmetry, but also it means we can run these experiments while we're going upwards. Now, again, we did a goo canister experiment when we were, you know, off the ground. But as it turns out, there's two different levels of the uh, of the atmosphere. If you're below 17,000 feet or meters, below 17,000 meters, that's one biome. If you're above 17,000 meters, that's another biome. So we can do a whole other goo experiment while we're still in the atmosphere, but in the upper atmosphere. And then we can do our second one when we actually reach space, which is going to be great. So we'll do the same thing with um, with the two press mats, even though we don't have one for the low atmosphere, but that's going to be okay. Um, and we're going to do the same thing with two um, um, thermometers. I'm going to turn off the symmetry, and I'm just going to put one there and one over here. So we'll be able to run lots of extra experiments over here. It's worth noting we'll only be able to have one crew report because unless you do some weird things where you EVA and shuffle in and out, uh, you can only have one crew report in your can. So we'll probably wait until we hit space because space experiments are going to be worth a lot more science than the ones in the atmosphere. We can always pick up the, ex the atmospheric ones later on. So let's call this one the Go to Space Mark 1 over here. We're feeling very, very enthusiastic about this, and hopefully we won't die. Before we launch, we'll double check our staging. First the engine goes, then the decoupler will go, and then finally we will parachute. That sounds about right to me. So let's go ahead and launch this. I think Jebediah is in the driver's seat, and that sounds a-okay. Now, as I mentioned, we don't want to go straight up, mostly because if we come straight down, we might come down way too fast. We want to go at an angle. At what angle do we want to go? So if we want to tilt a little bit, in which direction do we want to go into? Well, as it happens, the planet we're on is rotating, right? Of course it is. It rotates, that's how we get day-night cycles. If we hit M, we can get our map view over here, which is kind of handy. Here's our planet over here, and it is rotating around, right? Which is why we get day-night, because the sun's way over there. So as it rotates around, we get a day-night cycle. Well, if we want to launch and we want to go into orbit, Right? We want, we're going to want to go into a circle, either this way or this way. Well, it so happens that the planet is turning, if we're, face, if we're looking down on the North Pole, so right now we're looking down at the North Pole, this planet is rotating counterclockwise, which means our little ship is already going this way a little bit. Right? Think about that. We're on the Earth that is spinning, so our ship is already going this way a little bit. So we absolutely want to take off 
going this way because we're getting a little bit of a boost. If we decide to take off and go this way, we're going to have to A, cancel out all of the boost from the current rotation and then add that much more just to break even. Where So we may as well go this way. Which way is this way? Well, if we turn the view around, right? So this is the North Pole. So if that's north, this is east. We want to go east, which totally makes sense because clearly the sun rises in east, so the Earth must be uh, rotating in that direction. It's moving towards the sun. That's why the sun ro rises in the east. So we want to take off going east. Okay, we're going to hit M to go back to our view over here. Which way is east? Well, if we look at our little nav ball over here, it basically represents the view like this. Well, sort of the other way around, actually, like this, right? Because it's pointing straight up into the blue, blue, blue sky. East is 90 degrees, so that's to our right. East is that way, over the ocean. The easy way to remember this is you don't want to take off and fly over the buildings and fly over the cities and then kill a bunch of people if something goes wrong. You want to take off over the ocean because if something goes wrong, you won't hurt anyone, and that will be best. So what we want to do is we want to go in that direction. How much in that direction is a great question. Well, you don't want to turn right away because if you do, you're very likely to flip out and have horrible things happen. You know what? We're going to... I'm, I'm not even going to explain things right here. I'm just going to go to full fuel. I'm going to launch. I'm going to turn to the right. And I'm going to show that, oh my god, what's going on? I'm not turning. I'm not doing anything. We're Okay, their fins are stabilizing, but we're going to crash and we're going to go down and everything's going to die. Clearly, turning too early is very bad. We'll get a, a message in a second. A catastrophic failure. Oh, that's okay. We're going to hit this button here to revert to launch. Shh, don't tell anyone. This never happened. Uh, we just like went back in time. Uh, did a Doctor Who thing, we're back on the launch pad, everything is okay. Turning too early is bad. The rule of thumb that people tend to use is they go upwards until they reach about 100 meters per second or are about a kilometer above the sea level, at which point they start turning to the right a little bit. Only about 5 or 10 degrees. That's that's 10 degrees would be this first white notch over here towards the right. The right is the D key. Hitting D will point us towards the right. So when we get to about 100 meters per second, we're going to push the D key and try to end up at about the 10 degree mark. We're also going to turn on the SAS. Jebediah will try to keep us pointing whichever way we happen to be pointing. We can, over, with our WASD, with our, our controls, we can we can force the ship to move a little bit. And then whatever our heading ends up being at that point, Jebediah will try to maintain that. Our fins will also try to keep us pointing in into the wind, into the direction we're moving. Right? The fins try to keep us pointing in the direction that we're moving. So we have to take off again. We have a throttle here. We're going to bring a throttle to 100% on our takeoff. Okay, you can use shift and control to move the throttle. You can also use Z to set the throttle to 100% or X to set it all the way to zero. So we're gonna hit Z to go to full throttle. The SAS is gonna be on. We're gonna hit the space bar, which will ignite this engine. So going in three, two, one, launch. That's happening. Our surface speed is going up very, very quickly here. And again, when we hit about 100 meters per second, I'm gonna start turning towards the right. So I'm going to do that, and I'm going to try to bring it up to this notch. Now, I'm not just holding down the button. If I hold down the button, actually, apparently we didn't die, but sometimes you will, okay? It's going to be a lot of taps, and we're going to try to move over there. Now, a few things are starting to happen. First, you know what? I'm going to hit escape for a second to pause. Is there another way to pause? I think that there, there probably is, but I'm not sure. A few things are happening here. You can see, again, we're getting, like, the aerodynamic effects over here. This is us hitting the sound barrier. Sound barrier, the speed of sound is about 330 meters per second or something like that on the uh, at sea level over here. We are going so fast that we are slamming into the air and it's starting to feel thick. It's starting to be a problem. We are actually not doing this very efficiently. Anytime you see these white streaks, it means that you're actively having to force your way against the air, which means some of our fuel isn't going to making us go faster. It's mostly going towards fighting the air. We are, by going at max thrust, we're actually being less fuel efficient than if we were to dial back a little bit. But that's, that's a problem for another day. So that's thing number one that's happening there. Uh, the other thing, you'll notice that we got this yellow circle that appeared on the nav ball at some point. What is this yellow circle? The yellow circle in the nav ball is what's technically referred to as the prograde marker. What that represents is that's the direction we're moving in. The yellow circle is where we're moving. Whereas this dot, the orange dot from our little wingling thing over here, that's where we're facing. Now, 
because our little orange dot is most, more or less in the middle of the yellow circle, we are basically facing the same direction as we're moving, which is usually what you want to do. But you'll have noticed, in fact, let's go ahead and revert the flight again. We're going to revert to launch. We're going to do this launch again, and I want you to just stare at the nav ball, which actually is almost entirely all I do. I'm almost never looking at my ship over here. I'm flying by looking at the nav ball. So again, I'm going to turn on SAS, hit Z to go to full throttle, and hit the space bar. The second I do, the nav marker prograde shows up because that's the direction we're moving in. We're moving straight up, and we're pointing straight up. So when I hit 100 meters per second, again, I'm going to start tapping D to shift over to the right. And you can see I'm now facing to the right. Oops, I accidentally hit space bar on stage. Shh. We're going to have to revert again. Um, we're now facing to the right, but our direction hasn't caught up with it. It will soon. Soon, we'll, we'll be our direction will end up in the same direction we're facing because our engine is now thrusting in that direction. Except I've got to revert again because I accidentally staged. Here, I'll show you what happened. Uh, you can't really tell because it's still being pushed, but we're just the top part now, and that's it. The engine, it just happens to be pushing against us, but we're not actually physically connected anymore. So that's really bad. So let's revert one more time. And this time, for sure. Okay? So once again, SAS turns on. By the way, you can toggle that with the T key. Z for full throttle. Space bar only once. And once we hit about 100 meters per second, I'm going to start pushing over to the right. And... One really good rule of thumb is try not to move your your little orange marker, which is where you're facing. Try not to move outside of the yellow circle. As your spaceships get bigger and bigger and more involved, it's going to become really imperative that that happens because if you're out of the yellow circle, it means you're really... And I'm going to aim down a little bit. I'm just going to try to keep it on the 90 degree marker as much as possible. I'm just trying to pull it... Pull this yellow marker where we are. Um, so I'm on the 90 degree line to east, but I want to keep sort of tipping over further and further to the east over here. I want to keep pushing further sideways because I want to do that nice parabolic arc we talked about. So I'm going further and further and further to the side. I'm just going to keep nudging it, but I'm trying not to go too far out of the yellow circle because if you do, bad things can happen because you're not facing the way that you're moving. Okay? Very important rule when you're taking off. So we just noticed a few things show up here. These bars, this is our heat meters on some various parts. There's some parts that have gotten way too hot here. And again, it has to do with the fact that we are thrusting a little bit too much. Our engine is powerful enough and our ship is light enough that we are hitting the air so hard that we're actually generating friction and heat, in addition to just generally being inefficient. What I, should, what I should be doing is not being at full throttle over here. I should throttle it down, or I could have added more weight to the ship. Clearly, I could put more fuel tanks on here, which is what we're going to do next, because clearly our engine's got enough go that we could be pushing a much heavier ship and be really happy with that. So the fact that things are heating up over here means what? What do we do about that? Well, I, could, I, can, I probably should throttle down. Now, these are probably not going to overheat and explode right now. We're probably going to be fine. We probably got, you know, a good amount of time before it becomes a problem. And as we go up higher, we're now at 25 kilometers above the sea level here, uh, which means we're in the upper atmosphere. The atmosphere is thinning out. That's what this meter is happening over here. There's actually very little air over here. So, um, and we're going very fast, almost 1,300 meters per second. But as the air keeps thinning out, it's going to be less and less of a problem to generate heat. So really... I'm not going to worry about it right now. Just going to go ahead and resume flight. Continue trying to go a little bit sideways. And there we go. I'm now officially out of fuel over here. So there's really no more steering to do. I'm, I don't have my hands on anything. I'm just moving my mouse around. The stars are starting to come in. We're at 40 kilometers above the surface. So we're in the upper atmosphere right now. So we can go ahead and run some experiments. I'm not going to worry about it. it will, uh, you know what? No, I'll do it now. Mystery goo for the upper atmosphere. Excellent. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to go fast. We're going to get a crew report from the upper atmosphere. We're going to keep that as well. Barometric pressure from the upper atmosphere. Excellent. We're going to keep that. And we're going to do one thermometer report from the upper atmosphere. And any second now, when we hit 70 kilometers or 70,000 meters above sea level, we will enter space. Boom. We are now officially in space. We actually just completed another contract, which is to escape the atmosphere. Excellent. And we got some more milestones. We are still going up. If we hit M at this point, we can re-enter the map, and we can do something very interesting. So right mouse moves us around, zoom in. This is the path we're going to take. This is the apoapsis. This is the peak, the highest point of our 
well, it's not an orbit, it's, we're suborbital, but this is the highest point of it. We're going to hit 138 meters, or 138,000 meters, or 138 kilometers above sea level over here. Then we're going to start to dip down, and when we hit about 70 kilometers here, we're going to re-enter the atmosphere. Okay, so we got a little bit of time before that happens. Not tons, but some. And hit M again. So we're in space. This is very exciting. Very exciting indeed. We're going to run the rest of our experiments. So we're going to get a goo from space. Ah, there we go. Clumped into a sphere. Excellent. We cannot get another crew report right now. It would overwrite the old one. But actually, I'm going to do that because the crew report from space is going to be worth more science than the crew report from the upper atmosphere. We're going to run the second barometer, which is, I think, over here. So if we check this one, it says review. So this one's already got data in it, but this one here does not. So we're going to log the pressure data from there. Excellent. Turns out there's no air pressure in space. Who knew? And then I'm going to get the data from my second thermometer over here. And look at that, some more science. We are loaded with science, which is great. Now, before we re-enter, we need to get rid of all of this. Because again, this stuff will all burn up and probably explode when we re-enter the atmosphere. And horrible things will happen and probably we will die. So we are now going to stage. So that was stage two, the one with the engine. If I hit the space bar, we're going to go to stage one, which is going to activate the decoupler. Again, if I needed to, I could right-click and I could trigger the decoupler manually. But what I will do is I will hit, simply hit the space bar right now. And there we go. The decoupler has got a tiny explosive charge in there just to help sp uh, spread things out. So our ascent stage is now going to go away. It's going to burn up on its own. At some point, we may even, uh, if it's close enough still, we may even end up hearing the explosion as it re-enters, which is very exciting. And this is our capsule. This is the thing that's going to re-enter. I, I will say there is a possibility on re-entry that one or more of these science experiments might end up burning up because it might not be completely covered. Hey, if that happens, well, we'll just have to, to do the experiment again some other time. That's okay. As long as hopefully Jebediah doesn't die on his way back. Although, as it turns out, Jebediah, as well as the other three original astronauts you start with on normal mode, they actually can never permanently die. They will eventually come back home. Now, we are on our way down. You can see because there's a little blue arrow pointing down. We are technically dropping, but and we've passed the apoapsis, so we're coming down. The green line is our connection, our, our radio connection uh, back home here. Um, if we are kind of bored and you want things to go a little bit faster, there's something you can do about that. Over here, there's this time warp control, and you can go at times 5 speed, times 10 speed, and so on and so forth. We can accelerate time so that we can finish this a little faster. If we do that, let's say we go to times 5. So there you go. We're time warping at times five over here. We'll re-enter the atmosphere. The second we re-enter the atmosphere, it's going to automatically cancel the time warp. When you are time warping, you have no controls. I'm trying to do WASD here. Nothing is happening. If I stop the time warp, I have the ability to steer my capsule. Okay? Now you'll notice as I rotate around here, there's quite a few little symbols on the, on the nav ball. This one here, that's the prograde marker. That shows me where we're going. And in fact, if I say do this, I am now pointing in the direction that we're going in. Over there. That sounds about right. Well, it sort of sounds right, except, do you remember? What end is supposed to go first when you re-enter the atmosphere? We need the end with the heat shield to go first. So this would be very bad, because it's going to be the nose here that hits the atmosphere, burns up, explodes, and kills everything. So we need to turn so that the butt is going first over here. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to turn, and you notice there's another yellow circle. So we've got Yellow circle here, that's a prograde marker, that's the direction we're going in here. And the other yellow circle that looks a little different with the down sort of arrows here, that's the retrograde marker, that's the backwards direction. So if I put the yellow dot in there, it means we're literally facing away from the direction we're moving in, or another way to think about it is our butt is facing the direction we're moving in. Our nose is, is pointing away, our butt is facing forward. That's exactly what we want because we want our butt to hit the air first. And in fact, we are in the atmosphere now, and I was going to say, right about 40 kilometers, you'll probably start to see some of these atmospheric effects. So we're starting to get a little bit of flame going on. Um, our nav ball just changed from surface mode to, or from orbit mode to surface mode, so our retrograde marker changed a little bit. Now, I still have the stability assist here. I'm going to turn this off. It so happens that when your capsule is shaped this way, it is aerodynamically stable. The shape of the capsule will automatically stop us, will, will automatically keep the butt facing into the wind. It's very handy. So we are now, oh, I'm going to stop a sec. We are now um, getting quite close to the ground. We're less than 10 kilometers from the ground, or rather the water at this point. Now, I wanted to show something earlier, but I, I missed the opportunity to talk about it. 
Our little parachute icon here, for a while it was red. Then it became yellow, and now it's white. This icon, when it's red, it's telling you, if you were to go and deploy your parachute right now, it would rip off and burn off. Yellow is risky, white means it is safe over here. It feels like we're going too fast for that to be safe, but I think the numbers got changed at some point. Um, so it is telling us that it is now safe for us to deploy our parachute, which we can do in the space bar. If you deploy your parachute too early, when it's red, for example, it's just going to get ripped off, and that's a very, very bad thing. That's why it's important to come in sideways. Think about it. At 70,000 meters, right? 7-0 over here is when you first re-enter the atmosphere. At 4-0, things started to get hot. It's only when we got under 10 kilometers that it finally became safe for us to deploy the parachute. If we had come straight down, there's a good chance it would not have become safe for us to deploy the parachute until we were like two centimeters from the surface of the ground and therefore we would have crashed and all died. So we've avoided death, hooray! So now it should be safe for us to go ahead and deploy this parachute. So I'm just gonna go and hit the space bar at this point. Well, we could wait longer because once we deploy the parachute, we're gonna descend very slowly, obviously, right? Um, so we're seven kilometers. So I'm actually gonna play a little bit of chicken. You could always save if you're worried. Save the flight if you're a little bit worried about this. I'm gonna wait until we're a little bit lower before I start to deploy. We're still burning off a little bit of speed from the air pressure, not much. But just because it's gonna go and make things go a little quicker. All right, I'm pretty happy with this. We're gonna go ahead and deploy. Again, it'll do the partial deployment for now. It'll only fully deploy when we're, I think the default might be 500 now. I guess I could right click on it and see. Oh no, a thousand meters above the surface is when it's gonna fully deploy. And here it comes here. It's a sort of a slow full deployment, but it does kick in. We're now 300 meters and our surface speed is basically nothing. And none of our science experiments burned off. How wonderful is that? It uh, looks like we achieved some more milestones here. Land distance record. We've traveled over 100 kilometers. Um, and we haven't actually splashed into the ocean yet. Oh, I think I think some of our engine bits may have uh, fallen into the, uh, the ocean. That's kind of funny. So again, I'm a little bit bored, so I'm going to go ahead and time warp here. I'm going to go four times time warp. This is different. This is a physics warp. It's still fully simulating everything. We could actually steer while it's physics warping. The first time you do it, you will get a warning to let you know that, hey, by the way, physics warping is kind of dangerous sometimes, because if you've got a big ship, sometimes it'll sort of wobble itself apart. Um, but with tiny ones, it's very safe. So we have splashed down in the ocean. We are, you know, probably over 100 kilometers away from home. I don't see any land anywhere. Where did we land exactly? If we hit M to bring up the map, I am having trouble rotating. There we go. We're right over here. And the Kerbal Space Center is... Is it, is it, is it just over here? Oh yeah, it's right over there. So that's how far we got. That's where we, we took off, and that's where we got to way over here. So we're going to go ahead and just radio in that we would like to be recovered, please. Although before we do, before we do, let's have Jebediah EVA from here, and we can get an EVA report from the waters. We're going to keep this experiment, and we'll also get to show off something else. Let's board again. What we would love to do is get a crew report from the water here. But if we try to crew report, it's going to override the one we got from space, which we don't want to do. So how do we do another crew report from the water? Well, it's a little funny, but what we can do is we can EVA. Once we have EVA'd, we can right click on the capsule and we can take all the data out of this capsule. We could actually do that for any of the experiments. I could now take the data from the goo container. It will let me know if I take the data. By the way, you still aren't allowed to use the goo canister a second time. Goo canisters are a one-shot deal. It's fine. We're going to go ahead and remove this data anyway. So what's happening now is Jebediah is holding on to all the, um, the info from the goo report. He's holding on to his crew report from before. And what's going to happen when he boards this, he's going to store these science experiments inside the capsule, but in a different place than before. As a result, I don't know, he, he like he put it properly in, in you know the folder that the report is supposed to go into instead of the clipboard that's attached to his seat. As a result, we can now click on this and do a new crew report and it's okay. So you can only have one crew report sort of like sitting on the clipboard in the, the pod, but if you remove the data and then store the data properly, then you can do another one. It's kind of a finicky little thing, but it's just the way Kerbal is. So we can get a new crew report from the, the water. It's not worth much science, but we may as well do it anyway. And now we'll go ahead and recover the vessel and get a ton of science. So that brings us to the end of this episode. Next episode, we will be going for orbit. And I believe 
that will probably be our final episode. I'll talk a little bit about uh, how you might want to think about going to the moon, but really for the moon mission, you're going to be best watching a Let's Play uh, because there'll be a little bit more... There's just more in terms of building and things like that, and it's going to be pretty detailed in there. So thank you very much for watching, and next time we will enter orbit. See you then.